Hi, my name is Varun Painter. I'm the executive editor at India's biggest auto show on YouTube. It's called Power Drift. You can go and check it out later. Uh, but first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity. I am incredibly honored to be here and speaking to so many of you guys. Uh, this is a live session. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Uh, I hope everybody around you is safe. Uh, and I'm here to talk about my journey into this field of automotive journalism, how I got into it, what the past six years have been like, how it's changed in the past six years, and what does the future look like? And finally, what is that one message that I have for aspiring automotive journalists? So here it goes. Back in 2014, um, I was handling social media for a certain account back in Mumbai. And I just knew one thing that I always wanted to be around motorcycles, not even cars. I always wanted to be around motorcycles and that is all I wanted and uh, money didn't matter and the one thing that I was chasing was happiness in its truest and purest form and I knew that motorcycles were the key to happiness so um, there was a company called Power Drift back in the day and I became an instant fan uh, so whenever there was a video that used, to, that used to come out I used to go like the video share it I used to drop in a comment and I just was a very engaging fan back in the day as well. So I had a lot of fun engaging with the brand. So I was like, hey, you know what? They are doing some really cool stuff. That's something that probably nobody in India was doing back then. So I was like, I'm going to apply. Uh, they didn't have a page to apply as for, uh, for someone who wanted to get into the company. So kind of figure out where to write to, what to write and just wrote an email from the bottom of my heart as to why I wanted to be there and um, a month later I was there at Power Drift. I didn't join as an automotive uh, automotive journalist, I joined as a social media guy, made my way and here we are six years later doing the same thing just better and a whole lot of, um, with a whole lot of improvement if I can call it that. Now in the past six years a lot of it has changed as well in terms of how um, journalism has improved. Earlier it was all print, there was no digital and then when digital happened, websites happened, websites are still running strong, they get a lot of hits and stuff like that. But I think the key is when you're visually watching something, it's a lot enticing to watch, you're able to grasp that information uh, correctly. So YouTube came in and uh, YouTube kind of changed the entire game and I was there or fortunate enough to be there at a point when that industry was just about to take a shift from going uh, with going from print to digital and I was lucky enough like I said to be there and when it happened I was like this is the chance this is the opportunity but coming back to the same thing of how things have changed well, a lot of people are not going to go and buy magazines and I think that's a completely personal opinion a lot of people don't buy magazines they don't have the time to read they're constantly scrolling on their phone that is why a lot of these publications as well have completely gone digital, have completely rid, gotten rid of their print section. Uh, and I think in the future as well, digital is the space that will constantly keep evolving, evolving, constantly keep improving. So in that scenario, when I talk about how automotive journalism has changed, it has changed quite dramatically. Back in the day when I joined Power Drift as well, there weren't a lot of publications that were actually involved in the digital space. But now when you look at it six years later, there's so many people, so many magazines who have gone completely digital. There are so many individual content creators who are doing this. There are so many publications uh, who have gone from being small time automotive channels to being channels with a million followers and stuff like that. And at the helm of it is also language. Uh, so we decided to stick to English. We did give, it, give Hindi a try for a couple of these episodes, but... Unfortunately for us, it didn't work out, uh, but Hindi or regional languages are also something that a lot of these publications are invested in. Uh, I think it's very good because they're focused on a certain region of the country and that is really helping them because every day there's someone who's going to buy a new motorcycle, a new scooter or a car. And when it is explained to them in a regional language, it always helps. So in that scenario, I think regional channels are doing very, very well. Let's talk about something else as well, and that is individual content creators. Uh, people on YouTube fondly call them motor vloggers. 
uh, and that's uh, uh, that's basically carrying an action camera with you which is either mounted on the helmet on the chin of the helmet uh, or on top of the helmet or it's mounted onto the chest uh, using a chest strap uh, and that is something that has gained popularity as well and for people who do this very seriously who are heavily invested in i think my main thing is there are a lot of people uh, or my main input to this whole situation is there are is that there are a lot of people who are watching you for advice there are a lot of people who are going to take a certain product looking at your video only so when the information is put across or when the information goes out please make sure that it is absolutely 100% correct because what happens is when there is someone who goes ahead and buys a product which is either in in the motoring world it's either a car bike or uh, it's a car bike or a scooter that person is going to live with that vehicle that baby that investment of his hard earned money or her money uh, for a very long time so when you're giving out information i think it's very important to get all the facts correct it's very important to get all the specs all the information correct of course each one of them have got their individual flavor they have got um, a personal input for example there are some things that i don't like about a motorcycle but there are some things that uh, but the same things are being liked by someone else and that is totally fair but i think information when put out correct is absolutely critical uh, to a buying process so that is my only advice to aspiring motor vloggers i'm sure there is still a lot of scope for someone who wants to start right now so good luck and uh, ride safe it's considered uh the best is one of the best jobs in the country because i get asked this often at a lot of these meetups i i want to be like you i want to i want to do what you're doing and um you know this is what uh, i see myself doing and i think my advice to that generation of people is that there is no stopping you um it doesn't have to be that you got to work at partrift there are a lot of publications you can start like i said i spoke about motor vlogging there is something that you can do on your own um and it doesn't necessarily have to be at a company that i work for it can be at someone some somewhere else all you have to do is just be 100% into it if you are even 99% into it it won't work you have to give it a 100% probably more than that but that's what this is all about because this is something uh that can make or break a consumer's choice if you think you're capable enough and you say hey you know what i know what it 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 feels like to ride a motorcycle and to judge how a motorcycle reacts or how i feel on a motorcycle and how the motorcycle motorcycle kind of responds to me if you get that right then you absolutely have to do it and it doesn't necessarily like i said have has to happen with a publication it can happen with anyone else it can happen on your own you can start your own thing you can just take out a camera and shoot and that's i think one of the things that uh, i see a lot more happening of course it's happened in the past 6 years and a lot of individual creators have taken up pace uh, taken up um, uh, space in the motoring world and i think that's going to continue going into the future as well because it's very easy to just pick up a camera or an action camera or a mobile phone turn it towards yourself and start recording and i think it's a great thing we'll see the rise of individual creators going uh, uh, more into the future and that is something that cannot be stopped and i would love to see more of that happen because the more flavor you see on digital um, i think the better it is for you to understand as a consumer on what to buy and what to completely reject so the more you see I think there's also a bit of confusion that is added but uh, along with this confusion there's clarity as well because uh, there is something that I might miss but there is something that uh, there might be something that will uh, there there might be someone else who will spot that and vice versa there might be something that another creator will not spot and I will spot it or someone from my company or my colleagues will spot it so when you have that kind of Avail- availability of content and i and i think that is super important because like i said before as well it's something that you put in when you buying a vehicle it's your hard earned money and when you get all, all the information that you probably need it's probably going to cloud your head and um it's going to put you in a lot of confusion but it's also like i said it's going to give you some clarity as well so once that happens 
uh, it's superb. I think uh, it just solves your dilemma and it gets you information that you seek without even going for a test ride. And I think the final story to that is, of course, going for a test ride, experiencing the bike for yourself because that is where things make or break. So if you like the bike or the car or whatever, the scooter, then of course, you're going to go ahead and buy it. What else do I have to talk about? The one idea that has stuck with me over the years that is worth sharing. Um, I think I have kind of said this at the start of the video, but I would still like to encapsulate this in a way where uh, it has a deeper meaning. When you start, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys who are watching this are young, aspiring teenagers who want to get into a field um, probably pressurized by parents, uh, but there is a certain section of this this generation who wants to do something on their own. And I think my message for everyone out there, including both the sides, is the fact that money is important. Of course, money is at a certain age, money will be important. And that is going to be something that you cannot neglect. But at the same time, happiness is important too. It is extremely, extremely important to be happy and I say this because at the end of the day when you go back home you should have that energy that spark in you which tells you that hey you know what I've had a good day uh, tomorrow's going to be a great day again because I get to do the thing that I've always wanted to do and if that happiness is something that you can take care of then you're going to have a wonderful career for the rest of your lives and this is not just motoring whatever you do whatever you do Happiness is super important. There will be stages in your life where there will be a difference in balance. Sorry. Uh, where happiness might uh, take priority. There will be a stage in life where money will take priority. But what I'm trying to say is both of these things have to be there in some percentage. 80-20 or maybe 80, year, 80 on money, 20 on happiness. But both of these quotients of life have to be there. That's where things get more interesting. That's where I think uh, you will have fun. You will have a long lasting career. It will be a stress. I mean, stress is going to be there at work. I cannot deny that. But at the end of the day, when you come back home and when you come back with a smile, you know you're going to wake up the next day uh, wishing for another great day. So I think it's super, simple, super, super important. That is my advice to all the people who are watching this. Um, be happy. Be happy. Uh, there are times where you will think more from the head and less from the heart, but give your heart a listen to, um, you know, <laughs> when you become an, when you become 18, when you become an adult, you're free to do your own thing. You don't have to listen to your parents necessarily, uh, but we do. And uh, that's also a great thing. But when you become 18, you become independent. So I, I feel don't be pressurized by what parents have to say. Have a say in, in the things that you're about to do, in the life that you're about to choose. And go ahead and do that. Uh, earlier, there wasn't a lot of uh, scope for all these new genres of work that we are experiencing in the recent world, in, in the digital world. And it's paying dividends. I mean, you are getting money. People are earning money. There are different ways to earn money. And there's quite a bit of uh, money being made. So... In that scenario, when you think of it, um, it's not a 9 to 5 that job that you have to choose. It, it doesn't necessarily imply that, that you have to choose a 9 to 5 job. You can probably wake up at 6, end at 12. Find a job uh, that wakes you up at 6 but ends at 12. Find a job that starts at 8 p.m. but ends at 11 p.m., you know, for example. So in that situation, uh, find something that makes you happy. I think bottom line is that. Find something that makes you happy. Um, and just to sum it up, that's the thing that's going to uh, have or uh, make your career last long for the rest of your life. So I think on that note, uh, I will pretty much end this video. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be your, at least in the digital space and uh, uh, being uh, or getting that chance to just talk to you guys. I hope uh, you guys have fun. I miss this life of college and uh, being around friends and being out since morning, going back in the evening. I miss this life, but it is what it is. And uh, um, thank you so much. I wish I can just drop down to your college someday in the future and meet 
all of you guys but that's going to take a while because of the situation that we are in uh, but i hope to do that soon i promise i will i'll find a way to get there thank you so much once again for tuning in and uh, i hope you guys have a good day uh, i'll see you soon cheers bye bye Hi everyone I'm Rahul Das Gupta I am a design graduate from NIFT Kolkata I have recently started my menswear label in 2020 August I started my own studio but the journey was not really easy so it went back to 2010 when I was struggling with whether I should I should pursue fashion or not so my parents are from engineering background they wanted me to become an engineer so at my first graduation i finished in computer science i briefly worked for wipro for some time then i realized it's not for me then i pursued my passion which is fashion designing i tried for nift and i got it and after 4 years designing course i wanted to open my own label i had no experience at all but i had a little money i saved a little money to start my own label So I freelanced for a year as a fashion stylist after my graduation and I started my label without any experience at all. I came up with a collection. I didn't know what to do with that because I didn't have a client till that time. No matter how creative you are, you need to know where to sell your stuff because otherwise it just gets stock. What will you do with that money? So uh that was a failed attempt and that time I was on education loan so I had to pay the bank as well. So I was desperately looking for a job just to sustain, and then I got a job at Trukeru as a designer. In four years that I have been working as a women's wear designer at Trukeru, so I wanted to explore how good I am in men's wear. So I thought of exploring men's wear pattern and thought of coming up with my own label that day. So this idea I discussed with Trukeru, and they were gracious enough to accept the idea, and they become the business partner. with my own label so right now it's label rahul das gupta partnered by rukeru it's been 6 months that i came up with the studio the business is slowly picking up it was in lockdown when i started so things were not in a good condition but slowly and steadily we are we are picking up so this is my third attempt where i could sustain my own label for at least 6 months so when i graduated from nift i won the most creative design collection award So after that, I would thought I would come up with really creative collection. I would that would be my label. So I came up with that in my first attempt, and there was no clientele who would wear that. That's extremely creative. People would come and tell me it's very nice collection, but nobody would buy it. So eventually, if you are not going to sell your garments, there will be a loss of money, and you will be in depression. I was in a depression for some time. was thinking why aren't people buying it because it's really creative people are telling me that it's really nice and stuff like that but slowly and gradually with time i understood that it's very very important to know the client states people what people say nice to things and what people wear are completely different you need to know the balance between your creativity and sellability of the pieces so right now i am trying to balance my creativity with the sellable pieces i am making pieces which people can wear so my menswear collection speaks about urban men who like to dress up so i always play with a fine balance between class and quirk my garments are not too quirky that you can't wear it's basically a very classic silver i don't experiment with color much it's very restrictive color palette it's majorly blue black gray silver all these colors are there but i experiment with the surface and the fabrication of it i create a lot of creative surface development techniques there are a lot of tie and dye dory work slot seam hand packaging a lot of effort goes into one garment very detailed garments are there but at the same time it's not something that you can't wear i i use a lot of silk organza which is not quintessentially a menswear fabric but it just a very gender neutral fabric i feel which i think a lot of millennials can relate to because in today's generation people want something new people want something experimental that which speaks to their personality so i get a lot of clients who are of my age or younger my clothes resonate with them they they feel confident wearing it you know fashion has always been about expressing yourself it's a form of expression 
So, you know, and today's generation is being a little more uh, conscious about it. So they know what exactly they want to wear. They want to wear something which uh, speaks their personality, which is very, very important part of today's clothing. So, you know, uh, they feel powerful wearing it. So if we talk about power dressing, the concept started back in late 70s or 1980s. So uh, that time the society was male dominant and women wanted to prove themselves. They wanted to show that they are as equal as men. So that time the clothing of women become more tailored, high knit sweaters and padded shoulders and stuff like that. That was quintessentially, if we go by fashion rules, that was quintessentially how power dressing was. But is in today's generation, if we talk about power dressing, it's just not restricted to women anymore. It, it's more about men exploring their identity, gender orientation and stuff like that. It, it's, it, it's basically bridging the gap between men's clothing and women's clothing. And that's exactly what millennials do nowadays. They, they want to feel confident in the piece of clothing that they are wearing. They want something which speaks how they exactly are. So fashion has always been a form of self-expression. Back in 1980s, there are different kinds of subculture which existed. Punk, rock, goth, uh, hippie, grunge, all these subcultures, they had a very certain sort of dressing. So their form of dressing was to communicate with the society, what they want to showcase, what they want to prove. Right now, probably they don't exist anymore, that whole subculture, or maybe like a very minority of people. So the form of expression remains. I have a friend who shaved her head all of a sudden and she had beautiful long hair. She just shaved it all of a sudden. And we were really surprised. And she said she felt more confident in it. So, you know, what we realize is that fashion is not about being beautiful. It's just about being confident in your own skin. You can do whatever you wish. You can do whatever you wear as long as you feel confident in it. There is no rule about it. I don't believe in fashion. I mean, the fashion, I strongly feel the fashion rules should be restricted for the designers only. They should know all the rules, how to make clothes and what, what to make and what not to make. But the one who's wearing it, there is, there shouldn't be any rule for it. Anyone can wear anything that they want as long as they feel confident in it. And that is the form of self-expression that we all are trying to achieve here. Every millennial, every one of our age and younger to us or maybe older to us, they, they, they want to feel confident in it. And that's the ground rule. In today's world, the actual meaning of power dressing is you have to feel confident in it. Once you feel confident, the power, you exudes power. And that's exactly what power dressing is. Doesn't matter what body type you are. Doesn't matter what your age is. As long as you can carry off what you are wearing, there is no rule. If you are in your 50s, 60s or whatever, and if you wish to wear bright color, go for it. If you are a plus size person, and if you want to wear light colors, horizontal stripes, go for it. You just need to feel confident in it. And that's exactly what power dressing means. And today's generation uh, acknowledge that they are much more aware of the fact and they celebrate every kind of body. So along with being fashion conscious, one needs to be fashion aware and fashion responsible as well. So what happens is in today's world, fast fashion is capturing the entire fashion market. You get fresh of the runway copies where it is made out of non-biodegradable materials and at a very cheaper rate. So we tend, we as millennials tend to buy it because, you know, that will be a lot of clothing. We can buy a lot in that price. But what happens is because they are made up with non-biodegradable materials, you probably wear it once for your Instagram post and then you will donate it and it goes to the land pile. So it's creating harm for the environment. So I think as millennials, it's our responsibility to take care of the environment as well as being fashion aware. So if we can balance these two, I think nothing like that. So when we talk about power dressing, at, at the same time, we have to talk about the environment. It, our clothes should speak about our personality, but as well as if we are fashion aware and fashion responsible, that will take us long way from here. So I think for any millennials, the tip would be wear whatever you wish to wear. There shouldn't be any fashion. Rule. You, you have to be confident in it. That's just the rule. And at the same time, just be fashion responsible. That's it. Thank you.
Hello and greetings to everyone at the Xavier University Bhuvaneshwar. My name is Swapnadeep Datta and I'm currently working as a chef de party in the bakery and confectionery department at the Taj Exotica Resort and Spa in the Andamans. Well, today I'm here to speak on the topic food transcending borders. Now, first of all, before we go deep into the topic, I wish to ask you one thing. What exactly comes in your mind when I say the word food? Think over it. So, for you, do you think it is something which is there just to satisfy your hunger? Like, is it a part of just your mundane routine every day? I don't think so, it's so at least for the current generation. Food is no more what we eat. It has become an experience. And there are so many memories attached to it. It could be a dish which you're trying out for the first time, which you have never tried before. Or it could be sharing a meal with your near and dear ones. It also could be going to a restaurant to experience a particular cuisine, which you have never tried. Or I'm sure even for that matter, it could be a dish which a friend might have shared on Instagram and you have saved it so that you can go and try it out at a particular restaurant. So food is now more about an experience. It is no more just to satisfy your hunger. You don't really go to a restaurant just to eat food because you're hungry. Also, I feel as for me, eating out has now become more of a regular, like not we go out more often than ever before. With so many people living out of their homes, eating is like a part of your daily life, but still people wish to try out and explore the more variety, which is like, which is there at the market these days. So that's what we're going to need to discuss today. So before we discuss exactly how this rapid change in food, the food patterns occurred, let's just see what exactly are the changes that have taken place. So well, if you see some 20 years ago, dining out was in fact a luxury. It was not an everyday affair. People would go out to dine like once in a while, maybe on special occasions. Unlike the current generation where we are eating out on most days and eating at home on very few days. So what has brought about these changes? Well, first of all, the, the restaurants. In earlier time, restaurants which served international cuisines were very less in number and they didn't really appeal to the masses. But today, on the other hand, you can get international meals at ease, like the most affordable rates ever. In fact, today, it is as easy to get a meal to deliver to your doorstep just by the click of a button. Also, if you see in earlier times, there were not many restaurants which were based on particular concepts. You would have like just very limited cuisines. But today, if you go out, there are restaurants which are serving particular unique cuisine that today you'll find restaurants which even serve things like Armenian cuisine, Mexican cuisine, which wasn't really a fad in those days. Now there are restaurants which serve you a unique experience as well. For example, you might be sitting inside a train and having your food. You might have robots come and serve your food at the table. So all this has really made like eating out an experience. It is no more like a luxury affair which you can afford like once in a while. It is something which has appealed to the masses and people eat out more often than ever. So well, as you can see, food has traveled borders and today you can find almost any dish which is available across the world at your nearest restaurant. But yes, obviously it won't be as authentic as it is at the place because there are obviously changes due to the availability of ingredients, the cooking methods, and more such things. To explain this, let me give you a small example. The place where I'm currently working in, we have an outlet called The Settlers. It's a fine dining Indian restaurant. Now, the meal which you is served here is basically the meal which is cooked by the local people who have settled in the Andamans. So the chefs here, they've gone out to the different the small tribal houses and all and seen what they cook, what kind of ingredients they cook with and have developed a seven course menu. So the people who have settled here, basically the people who have come from the entire eastern coast of India. So there are people who have come in from West Bengal, there are people who come from Jharkhand, Orissa. So basically in settlers, we serve the food which is from the people who have settled in Andamans. 
So these are people who have traveled all the way from the various parts of the eastern coastal areas, from the states of West Bengal, Odisha, Jharkhand, Andhra Pradesh, and even Tamil Nadu. So the cuisine is a mix or rather a confluence of the ingredients and as well as the ingredients which are grown locally and the ingredients and the cooking styles which are used by the people from these states. So you might find something like a fish which is cooked with curry leaves and mustard oil at the same time. So that's how food changes when it travels from one place to another. It adapts itself to the local cuisine as well, to the local styles of cooking based on the availability of ingredients. Well, so let's now discuss what exactly are the factors which have brought about this rapid movement of food across the borders. How have people been embracing this change? And how are we as the millennials involved in this? So the first reason behind this rapid movement of food is obviously the movement of people. In earlier times, people moved or migrated to new places in search of a better life. That's when, when people moved across, they obviously carried a part of their culture with them. And of which obviously food is a very important part. So when people moved, they started cooking or making their own style of food in this new land, which slowly and eventually became popular when people started having community dining experiences. They tried out new food and it slowly became a part of their culture as well. Now we as millennials are open or always open to try new types of food. Also, the current generation is much more traveled compared to the older generations. We travel for work, we travel for leisure. We are open to trying out new things. We visit places to try out their food, their culture. We want to experience the local things, unlike staying in hotels, if you see. Most of the millennials will prefer something called as homestays because it is the best way to delve and you know, dive into the local culture. Also, our generation is always short of time. We want meals that are much more quicker. If you see in earlier times, meals were an elaborate affair. But today, we want food which is available quickly, can be carried easily, and can be had with a spoon and fork. That's how food has changed. And that is why people have more readily accepted the Western food philosophies. Today, if you see, foods are served in bowls and there are restaurants which serve single portion meals so that it is easier for people to eat, for people to carry along with them. Also, we as millennials, we believe in joys of eating beyond survival. For us, eating is not, not just more to fill our stomachs. It is an experience for which we are ready to go far and wide. Also, if you see, Things which were common in for people in the earlier days are slowly becoming food trends. For example, things like sardo. Sardo was basically a bread for the common people, which would be made which would be made on a regular basis. But today it suddenly caught up as a trend. People have moved back to the older traditions of baking bread without the use of commercial yeast. Also, if you see in India, the system of serving all the food on a single plate in the form of a thali was something which we have often done earlier. But the current generation has made it a trend because it was something that was not commonly what, what they have observed as growing up. So now there are restaurants which are dedicated to serving thalis, which is itself an experience for the current generation. Simple things like kombucha, specialty coffee, Acai bowls have suddenly caught up as trends because they are often visually appealing. So if you see, food has evolved a lot and there are a lot of trends catching up and we as millennials have been absolutely involved in it. If you see, more than 40% of our conversations are about food. We love to discuss our meals. We are more concerned about the ingredients that go into our meals where it is grown, how it has been processed. We love to click our food. Our food has to be Instagram worthy. That is how 
and that is why today companies are also focused on millennials when it comes to do their marketing designs companies have targeted millennials when it comes to product development they know that we as a generation are capable of taking something ahead and making it a trend and also at the same time ignore something because we don't like it that is why if you see most of the food campaigns today are along the line of the millennials so now how much has food evolved and how are we as a generation of millennials involved in this so the very first thing that is there if you see dining was a very elaborate experience in earlier times people would take out time from and go out to dine and it would usually consist of us but today as millennials which is a fast paced generation we do not have that much time we wish to get our meals quickly and something that we can carry around and something that can be eaten without much of an hassle because of which something like a multi course meal is slowly fading out we want our meals to come to all together in a single serving so that we can carry it along with us easily also if you see the variety of ingredients that we have today is much more than what we used to have earlier today we have access to ingredients across the world something which is freshly harvested today in some other part of the country can be easily made available here by the next day itself today's generation is very much focused on what they eat we love to know where our ingredients have come from how they have been sourced whether they have been organically grown so things such as these is what makes dining for a millennial different compared to what it was in the earlier times also another important fact is visual appeal as they say we dine with our eyes our food has to be instagram worthy we love to click the meals that we eat if you see today whenever a dish comes to your table the first thing that we do is click a picture of it so today if you see most restaurants they they will advertise themselves through pictures because after all they as they say jo dikhta hai wahi bikhta hai and also the food should sound interesting gone are the days when something simple a simple sounding dish would appeal to the masses your dish should have ingredients it could be something like simple local ingredients but should be made in such a way that it sounds appealing to us so this is how the whole food trend has changed and how the market is currently catering to the millennial generation we as a generation have a much more say when it comes to experiencing a meal and because of how we connect with people most food companies try to advertise their products through millennials so i would like to sum up by saying that as you see we as a generation have a lot of potential to drive the trends to differentiate the good from the bad so let's divert this abundance of energy towards the right direction thank you and have a great day have you ever wondered why the italian words espresso and cappuccino got so popular in india to me that's a great marketing strategy the funny thing is this marketing was not even done by italy it was done by america what we do have in common with italy is that india is the biggest supplier of robusta coffee to italy coffee has had a global journey to become the second most traded commodity in the world after crude oil of course my short talk is an attempt to lay out the facts to give you a sense of where we are headed in the millennial generation the craze around this bean might look strange to an outsider So here's a quick history lesson to bring you up to speed. Coffee has evolved in waves. Before the first wave, coffee was not accessible to people like you and me. This was a time where people had beer for breakfast because beer was guaranteed to be filtered unlike drinking water. Coffee was still spreading around the world at a slow pace. Drinking it at home was reserved only for the rich and the elite. The first wave made coffee available to people at large. This was around the late 1800s. 
Here, major companies like Maxwell House and Folgers made coffee accessible by selling it in tins and later on in instant form. The craze was massive. Imagine if something as exclusive as caviar suddenly became affordable to people. People were drawn to it immensely. Now, the second wave saw the rise of American cafe culture, a mix of post-war European immigrants and American marketing. This hybrid happened due to a demand for a better cup of coffee. Since audiences were familiar with coffee, the second wave guys spiced it up by bringing the Italian espresso and the espresso based drinks to the menu. This is where the infamous cappuccino we are so familiar with entered the game. Very community driven, second wave is also responsible for the look and feel of the modern cafe. Through strategic marketing, they made going out for a coffee the idea of a perfect, perfect date. With focus on fresher roasts and telling you where the coffee was from, the second wave had good intentions. However, in an attempt to pull more crowd in, they began to focus more on milky and sugary drinks. Somewhere along the way, coffee just became incidental to the cafe experience. The third wave guys stepped in to change that in the 1970s. They wanted to bring what the second wave started to its logical conclusion. To them, coffee was the superstar. A rise in tech and science made craft of roasting more consistent and measurable. It also raised important questions like, do we always have to roast dark? Does coffee always have to taste one way? Can coffee be fruity and floral instead of nutty and chocolatey? Put simply, the third wave looks at coffee like how sommeliers look at wine. They check the soil, land and altitude before procuring their raw coffee beans. Roasting coffee can either accentuate or delete flavors in a particular bean. Light roast have natural, fruity flavor, whereas dark roast delete natural taste and replace it with nutty and chocolatey flavors. The amount of effort to do this is so massive that they want you to drink the coffee as fresh as possible. What large coffee corporations won't tell you is that coffee more than 30 days old is stale. It won't make you sick, so it can still be sold, but it won't taste like anything nice. As part of our quality checks, we look for amazing flavors in the bean instead of adding them externally. That's why most third wave fans drink their coffee black. With every wave, the gap between the coffee farmer and the coffee roaster has gotten smaller. In the first wave, the big coffee companies used middlemen to speak to coffee farm cooperatives. In the second wave, the coffee companies cut out the middlemen and spoke to the cooperatives, which is called fair trade. Today, we talk to our farmers directly, which is also known as direct trade. The third wave came to India in 2013 when a close friend of mine, Matt Chitranjan, started roasting coffee artisanally in India. To give you a taste of what Indian farms are like, Here's what happened when I went down to the south to visit our plantations when I was founding Dope Coffee Roasters. Before I set up Dope Coffee Roasters, I did a two-year period of intense R&D. I still remember my first farm visit. At the time, farmers were selling beans in bulk, with no mention or focus on the estate name or locale. You see, coffee only got privatized in the 80s in India, after a landmark case, so that farms were still exploring and discovering their identities. The world's major coffee companies all have big offices in South India. This makes sure that the beans that they want are bought and exported immediately. My job was to convince the farmers who made India's best beans to sell high quality produce to me. An aim all third wave coffee companies have in India share is also that they provide access to the nation's best produce to its own people. Another hurdle to this was that third wave follows a global set standard set by Speciality Coffee Association. In this coffee is given a score of out of 100 by professional tasters called Q graders. Only coffees that score about 80 count as speciality. A personal criteria for us partnering with our farms that were free of animal cruelty, promoted modern practices and followed sustainable methods. We wanted to enjoy what the land gave us respectfully and not rob it off for what is worth and run. In my search, I encountered many good farms, but I had to turn them down because they did not align with SCA requirements. Elephant tranches, no support to local population, no schools or premises, heavy pesticide use, no uh, sanitization on, uh, on, on your estates, all these were no-go. Our belief as Thurgood Coffee Roasters is to create a better demand to ensure better supply. We are not aiming for quantity, but we are pushing for quality. India is the 10th fastest growing coffee market in the world. In 2020, it hit a revenue of $493 million only in roasted coffee, 
with an annual growth expected of 8.6 CAGR. In a poll, 66% of millennial views coffee as a favorite beverage. Clearly, Gen Y likes a good cover, but they're not really looking to settle for any kind of coffee. Because unlike others before, millennials' interests are not limited to only what they see around them. Phones and social media act as a window to the world at large. As a result, the range of things this generation is passionate about are more varied than ever before. This is why we do what we do for the audience of tomorrow. Since millennials are paying top dollar, they also want brands to align with their sensibilities. This is a strong move towards conscious consumption and thankfully that's something we are fully on board with. Millennial drinkers are also more open and to experimentation. They are open to expanding the definition of what a coffee can mean. This can be seen with how fast they embrace the new drinks like cold brew, pour over, ice pour over, Chemex and even coffee cocktails for that matter. Brewing tech and gear has become so much more affordable and diverse than it's ever been that cafe level experience at home is super easy. Coffee today is where wine was before it exploded in India 10 years ago. No one expected a small town like Nashik in Maharashtra to be a hotspot for wine, but it grew to be one. Personally, I think the future of coffee will be along the similar lines. When I say coffee farms in India, I'm pretty sure you immediately think of the South. But thanks to growing demand for artisanal beans, other farming states are also beginning to see the value in growing quality coffee. It might come to you as a surprise, but Odisha is one of them. Today, there are tribals in a place called Koraput who are growing SCA quality beans and processing the coffee in SCA prescribed standards. We came to know about this through a group called Tribal Project. These guys have done great work to bring tribal farming awareness to the nation. From what I can tell, Tribal farmers at Koyapur are just one of many new developments in India that is going to witness the coming upcoming coffee revolution. I am hoping what I said inspires you to go check out your local coffee shop and support your local coffee roaster. Since inception, the coffee scene has always been a community endeavor. To help that community grow, Dope works towards building more entry points for those who are interested to join. The specialty coffee market in India is, is just about forming and we are excited to be there and give it shape. This is what I'm learning from Dope Coffee Roasters signing off. Thank you for watching. Stay safe. Stay dope.